Hello, everyone, and welcome back. In the previous few videos, we we introduced power series and then extended that notion to talk about, in particular, Taylor and McLaurin series. And then in the last video, we talked about Taylor's theorem, how we can quantify the error using a finite approximation of, uh, of a Taylor series. Now, the goal of the lecture today is going to be to uh, sort of showcase some applications of Taylor series. So we're going to start by talking about uh, binomial series. So these are one plus x to some power. That's where we'll start. But then we'll show how we can use Taylor series, and in particular Taylor's theorem, to numerically approximate integrals of functions that we wouldn't be able to find uh, just using pencil and paper methods. And continue to explore how we can evaluate indeterminate limits. So something like sine x over x as x goes to zero. So all of this can be done using Taylor series. So that's what we're going to talk about today. OK, let's start by talking about binomial series. So let's consider the following function. Let's imagine that we have uh, f of x is equal to 1 plus x to some power m. And we'll assume that m is non-zero. It could be an integer. So 1, 2, 3, 4, or minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, so on and so forth. Or it could be a rational number. It could be 1 half. Or it could be a real number. It could be pi. Or it could be e. Or it could be e to the pi. OK, so it could be anything that we want here. Let's first uh, do some, some evaluations. So let's do f prime of x. In this case, we get m times 1 plus x to the m minus 1. Similarly, f double prime of x is m times m minus 1 to the 1 plus x to the m minus, sorry, m minus 2. And we'll do another one before we comment on the pattern. Uh, for the third derivative, we have the multiplication of m times m minus 1 times m minus 2. 1 plus x to the m minus 3. And so in general, you can see that the kth derivative here is equal to m and then times m minus 1 times m minus 2, and then all the way up to m minus k plus 1, 1 plus x to the m minus k. So you can, you can easily see this. And so therefore, at x equal to zero, we have, we have the Taylor series f of x is equal to, and so let's just sort of write in what we have. Uh, f at zero is one, f prime at zero is m times x, or sorry, is m and then multiplied times x. And then f double prime at zero is m times m minus one. Remember, we have divided by two factorial now times x squared plus the third derivative m times m minus one times m minus two divided by three factorial times x cubed plus, and then the general term here is m times m minus one, m minus two dot, 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 m minus n plus 1, 1 plus, a, uh, sorry, that part is not in here, uh, divided by n factorial x to the n, and you can keep going up. Now, here's the thing. First of all, if you look at this function, clearly if m is a, a positive integer, you know, 1, 2, 3, 100, whatever it happens to be, then this thing is just a polynomial. You can just expand out those brackets and it's just a regular old polynomial. So that means that your Taylor series approximation or your Taylor series sum only has finitely many terms because after some number of derivatives, everything is zero. All the derivatives are zero, right? Uh, the, the second derivative of a linear function when m is equal to one has is zero. And so the third derivative is zero and the fourth derivative is zero and so on. Same thing for a quadratic polynomial. The third derivative is zero. And so the fourth derivative is zero and so on and so forth. Now, sorry, this goes all the way across. The beauty of this is that this works if m is an integer or not. So it works for 
any value of m here. So this is what we call the binomial series. And in fact, you can very easily check that this thing will converge for x between minus 1 and 1 when m is not an integer. Uh, so a positive integer. If it's a positive integer, it's a polynomial. It's always going to converge. We don't have to worry about that. So let's just summarize this. The binomial series. And so this says uh, for minus 1 less than x, which is less than 1, we're going to write, or we have 1 plus x to the m. And I'm going to introduce a nice little shorthand so that we can get ourselves through this. So n is equal to 1 to infinity. And then we're going to introduce the mathematical choose function. So maybe you've seen this, maybe you haven't. But if you haven't, that's quite OK, because I'm going to tell you what it's equal to. So where we define. So we define uh, m choose 1 to be m, m choose 2 to be m times m minus 1. And in general, m choose n is exactly that nth term that I had above. So this is m and then times m minus 1 times m minus 2 all the way up m minus n plus 1 divided by n factorial. Uh, and this is for n greater than or equal to 3. So maybe you've seen this if you've studied any uh, uh, probability or statistics. You know, these are, these are related to combinations. Uh, but again, if you haven't seen that in the terms of combinations, that's OK, right? Now we have a formula right here. We don't have to think about it too much. Uh, the only thing that matters is you know, we've got the formula. Okay, so you know how is this useful? Well, this helps us approximate a lot of functions that we come across, uh, uh, you know, in sort of everyday calculus. Not in everyday life, of course, but in sort of everyday calculus. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's say if m is equal to minus one, uh, then what do these these uh, choose functions come out to be? Well, you get minus one choose one. This gives me minus one, right? Because uh, m choose one is just m. So m is equal to minus one. Minus one choose two. This gives me uh, minus one. Oh, sorry, this should be over two. I apologize. Uh, minus one times minus two divided by two, which is just equal to, uh, uh, sorry, positive one here. And in general, we're going to get minus 1 choose n. Well, this is going to be minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, all the way up to minus 1, that's m, minus n plus 1. So this is just using the formula divided by n factorial. And now you can see that you can factor all the minuses out first. And this gives you minus 1 to the n. There are n terms in the denominator. So you have a minus 1 coming from each one. And then you have 1 times 2 times 3 all the way up to n, which is n factorial on the top. You've got n factorial on the bottom. So this leaves you with minus 1 to the n. And so therefore, 1 plus x to the minus 1 is equal to 1 minus x plus x squared minus x cubed plus x to the 4 minus x to the 5 and you know so on and so forth where you go all the way up just alternating signs as you, uh, depending on if you have an even or an odd exponent. Now, of course, you know, you probably already knew this one because this is the same as um, the one minus x series, right? So one, minus, one over one minus x series. We've talked about that one quite a bit. And you're substituting x is equal to minus x. You can get the same answer here, but now we have a sort of shortcut using the binomial 
uh, theorem. Okay, let me show you another example. Maybe that one is not that exciting to you. As I mentioned, you can get that from previous work. But here's another kind of fun one. Uh, let's look at the square root of one plus X. So this is one plus X to the one half. Now, sometimes a, a kind of old school uh, engineering trick that people do is they say, well, basically this is the same as, you know, one plus X over two when X is small. So this is similar to what I talked about in a previous video where I said, sometimes people approximate sine of X by just X when X is super small. And we saw that coming from uh, the Taylor approximation, right? The, just the leading term in the Taylor approximation for sine of X is X. So you're just doing, you know, you're truncating at the very first term. Well, then it would make sense that this little approximation that I showed you here is sort of coming from truncating at two uh, polynomial or two orders in your Taylor series. And so that is exactly what's gonna happen. So in this case, we have M is equal to one half in the binomial series. And so we can use that formula to get all of the terms in this thing, not just the first one. So we get one plus X to the one half. Well, this is one plus M times X. So M is one half, so we get X over two. And then let's just sort of fill in the terms term wise in terms of what M is and what uh, what our what our formula dictates we have to have. So you just are going back to this binomial formula right here and putting M is equal to one half in here and determining each term. And so, oh, sorry. Then the next term here, same thing. So we get one half minus one half and then minus three halves. And this is all divided by three factorial x cubed, and then plus, I'll do one more. We'll go up to the fourth order here just for illustration. So if we wanted to, we could get a better approximation uh, for the square root of one plus x. So this is just following that choose function formula. So I'm not doing any magic here, nothing too exciting, just plugging in the respective values. And if you clean this up with a calculator, uh, you're going to get one plus X over two. That's the approximation that I showed you at the top here. And then minus X squared over eight uh, plus X cubed over 16 and minus five X to the four over 128. And then, you know, things get, the numbers get a little uglier from there on out. But the point is, you know, if you wanted to get a better approximation than, than could have been used by just saying this is approximately one plus X over two, you could approximate it by the first three terms instead. You could say this thing is approximately one plus X over two minus X squared over eight. Or you could use four terms to get an even better or more accurate approximation, right? This is what Taylor's theorem tells us, that the more terms you use in that expansion, the better your approximation is going to be. Now, what we can also do is we can use some properties of power series in order to get um, approximations of other functions. So this is where a little bit of creativity might come in. So for example, you can imagine that, that instead, I gave you this function. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, um, yeah, okay, this, this thing is uh, pretty ugly. I don't really want to take derivatives of it. I don't want to use the Taylor series because it's going to be a lot of work. I'm not sure I can find the pattern. But what you do know is that this is one plus minus X squared all to the one half. So this thing is a composition of the function minus X squared with the binomial expansion we just used. So that means that we can just replace all of the X's we see in the binomial expansion above with minus X squared. So let me show you. This thing becomes 
one, and then plus minus x squared. So we're replacing the x term. So this is just a, a function composition divided by two, and then uh, plus, uh, sorry, minus, minus x squared squared divided by eight, and then plus minus x squared cubed divided by 16, and I'll leave it at that. And so then you can clean this up. You get one uh, minus x squared over two, and then minus x to the four over eight, and then uh, minus x to the six over 16. And you can calculate out the rest of the terms from there. And you can do the same thing. You can do the same little trick. If you want to approximate one minus x squared, you can just take the first few terms in this and you can use Taylor's theorem to tell you how accurate that's actually gonna be. Okay, how about another one? Here's another fun one. One plus, uh, sorry, one minus one over x. Same thing, right? This is one plus negative x to the minus one to the one half. And you can do the same process that I just did there to find this is one minus x to the minus one over two minus uh, one, uh, one x to the minus one, sorry, uh, over eight, x to the minus two, sorry, because it's squared, and then so on and so forth, which you could clean up and you could say this is one over two x, and then this is one over eight x squared, and you can keep filling in the rest of the terms there if this is uh, something that you wanna do. The important point is that this one now, this expansion is for one over x small. Why? Because the original expansion was for x small because you centered around x equal to zero. And so since you're doing a composition here, now you're replacing all of the x's with one over x. And so now you have to have the absolute value of one over x small, which is the same as saying x is large. So that's kind of weird, right? This gives you a, a Taylor series that is sort of for big values instead of small values, all right? So sometimes these are called Laurent series, uh, but that, that is something that we can talk about uh, in another lecture. But the point is, you know, because you're substituting for the original variable x, you're also substituting for the bounds where these things work. So if x is small in the original series, then one over x has to be small in this new series. Okay, so that's one application of Taylor series, right? Is to find these binomial expansions, these binomial series. And of course, you know, I shouldn't have to argue with you that these things are important. Uh, because you've probably seen these functions coming up quite a lot, these binomial, uh, these functions that have binomial series approximations. But how about uh, one that is that is really ugly, right? Um, this is one that we have purposely avoided uh, having to do in our uh, in all of our work on integrals because I don't have an answer. I don't know what the integral of this function is. I don't have a technique, right? Partial fractions won't work. Uh, integration by parts won't work. You know, all of those techniques, we're still uh, out of luck with the integral of sine x uh, squared. But we can use the property of Taylor series to expand out the integral of, uh, sorry, the, the integrand sine x squared and then integrate term by term. And then life is pretty good. So let's express this as a power series. Well, all that we need to do is substitute x squared into the power series for sine of x. So that tells us that sine of x squared, so you might have to go back in your notes and remind yourself what the power series of sine, sine is, and then replace every term where you see an x with an x squared. So the first term in the power series of sine x was x. That means this first term in the power series of sine x squared is x squared. 
Similarly, you get x to the 6 over 3 factorial, and then uh, x to the 10 over 5 factorial. So you're basically just doubling the powers in the sign expansion um, over 7 factorial, and then x to the 18 uh, over 9 factorial, and then so on and so forth, right? We're just going to use the first few. But now, you know, life is good. These are all just polynomials. I can integrate this term-wise. So therefore, the integral of sine of x squared dx, well, I get x cubed over 3. That's just integrating up the x squared term. And then I get uh, minus x to the 7 over 7 times 3 factorial. I'm not going to simplify the constants just because uh, it's, it's a, it, I think it's actually easier to see the process without simplifying them. And then x to the 11 over 11 times 5 factorial minus x to the 15 over 15 times 7 factorial. And then I'll put one more in here. Uh, let's do x to the 19 over 19 times 9 factorial. And then there's infinitely many more terms. And because this thing is an indefinite integral, I've still got a plus C on the end. Now, a lot of times you'll see people do this because there's infinitely many terms that are technically need to be squeezed into here. People like to put this, the plus C at the beginning. So if you, if you look in the textbook, you know, you'll see this as C plus the rest. Um, I just wanted to put the plus C on the end because I feel like that's where it typically goes. Okay. so. Okay, let me uh, let me read your mind. You're thinking, Jason, uh, that's that's kind of cute, but you know what could I use it for? Right? What's the what's really the point? Uh, this power series is pretty ugly, and I don't know what it converges to, and so you know I still don't have a closed form for what the sine of x squared uh, integrates to. But as we've talked about quite a bit when we talk about integrals, in particular definite integrals, a lot of the time. What matters to mathematicians, physicists, engineers, just scientists in general, is what the value of a definite integral is. In particular, the approximate value using something like the trapezoidal rule or Simpson's rule that we've talked about in previous lectures. Well, what Taylor's theorem allows us to do is it gives us another way of approximating these integrals. So let me show you. Let me show you how cool this is. So how about I ask you to estimate the integral uh, from zero to one of sine of x squared dx with an error uh, of less than, let's say 0 0.001 here. So 10 to the minus three. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, I've already used my Taylor series to evaluate uh, the indefinite integral. Now what I do is I evaluate the indefinite integral at the upper and lower bounds and subtract them from each other. Now, the first thing that you see is that when x is equal to zero here, everybody disappears. And so I'm really just left with the upper bound. And so the c's don't matter either. We know this. We've done lots of definite and indefinite integrals now in our time. And so essentially, I'm just plugging x equal to 1 into that series expansion for my integral. So I get 1 third. That's the x uh, cubed over 3 term at x equal to 1 minus 1 over 7 times 3 factorial. And then plus 1 over 11 times 5 factorial minus 1 over 15 times 7 factorial plus one over 19 times nine factorial. And that's as far as I'm gonna go. But here's the point, what have I done? I took an extremely hard definite integral and turned it into an infinite sum. And so this tells me that I can approximate the, the value of this by just truncating. So in particular, maybe I'll put this in green, if you evaluate what 1 over 11 times 5 factorial is, this thing is 0 
zero seven six, which is already smaller than my um, than my given error tolerance that I was interested in. Right, I was I was asked to approximate this thing up to ten to the minus three. So, what that tells you from Taylor's theorem is that I can approximate this definite integral to an error of 0 0.001 using just the first two terms of that sequence. So therefore, the integral from zero to one of sine of x squared dx is approximately equal to, in this case, you get one third minus one over seven times three factorial, which is uh, just 42. So I'll just multiply that down for you right now. Three factorial is six, seven times six is 42. This gives me 0 0.310. So this tells me, again, using Taylor's theorem that I have approximately the value of this definite integral to an error of 0 0.001 is 0 0.310. Now, imagine, uh, you know, I wanted to go further. So also, I could use two more terms in here. And this would give me uh, an extremely accurate uh, estimation of this thing. So for example, I could go up with two more terms. So I've got one third, and I'll, again, just write them as seven times three factorial and then one over 11 times five factorial and minus one over 15 times seven factorial. And in this case, you know, I'm gonna get an approximation of 0 0.310268. And that is an extremely accurate error. This is accurate to about 10 to the minus six. So accurate uh, with an error of 10 to the minus six. So double what the error that I was asked for was. And how do I know that it's accurate with respect to that error? Well, that is just, I just need to calculate what the value of one over 19 times nine factorial is. So if you throw that in your calculator, you see that that thing is smaller than 10 to the minus six and boom, Taylor's theorem gives you a nice approximation. So this is beautiful, right? You turned an extremely complicated integral problem into a pretty easy calculator problem, like as far as a computer goes, right? I can pull in, I can put in one over three and one over seven times three factorial, right? These are easy things to do on a computer. And I did it with only four terms, right? That's incredible. I got six digits of accuracy with only four terms. And so, you know, if you give me an accuracy, you want, you want 20 digits of accuracy? Sure, I might have to go up a few more terms, but I can do it, right? I just need to figure out which element of this sequence uh, is below 10 to the minus 20, and then I'm good, right? That's all that needs to be done here. So this gives us a really, really nice way of approximating integrals without having to like discretize space when, uh, which is what we had to do for something like the trapezoidal rule. Okay, let's take a look at another example. Uh, in this case, just another use of, of Taylor's theorem. And so this is going to involve arctangents. Now, you remember how we got uh, the series for arctangent. We got the series for arctangent by uh, recalling, so we knew that 10 inverse of x is equal to one, uh, sorry, the derivative of the 10 inverse of x is equal to one over one plus x squared. Now this is, this is an example of my binomial uh, problem, right? This is technically one plus an x squared n to the two. So there's a binomial problem with any m equal to two and with a composition with x squared. But you don't have to remember that. You can just uh, recall how to expand this thing um, using our, our usual techniques. Uh, sorry, that's to the one, pardon me, m to the one. And we remember that this thing is given by 
one minus x squared, and then plus x to the four minus x to the six, and so on. And we got that tan inverse can be found by termwise integrating this thing and finding the value of C. So you might have to go back in the videos to refresh your memory on this thing, but this gives us X minus X cubed over three plus X to the five over five minus X to the seven over seven. And again, this checks out because tangent or, or uh, tangent is an odd function, which means that arctangent is an odd function. And so, you know, we have a solution here. Okay, or so, sorry, so we have all of the odd terms present only, pardon me. Okay, well, what's another way that we could do this? Well, let's do something. Let's, let's try and approximate the uh, arctangent function and show that we actually have convergence here. So we're gonna go backwards through what we did and we're gonna do this a whole different way using Taylor series and in particular Taylor's remainder theorem. So here's what we want. We've got one over one plus T squared. So this was the derivative of the arctangent function. I'm gonna use T because we need a dummy variable for integration in a moment, okay? So we're gonna prove that this is actually the series. Now, what is this? This is one minus t squared. So again, it's just what we have, just using t's. And if you're a little confused, that's okay. We're going to see why I chose t's in a moment. It's just because I need them to be integrated away. And then plus the general term minus one to the n, t to the two n, and then plus Technically, this thing is going to keep going forever, right? And it's going to be minus one to the n plus one times t to the n plus two, and so on and so on and so forth. But that's a geometric series. So I can add up all of the terms on the end, and I can actually just write this as minus one to the n plus one, t to the two n plus two, divided by one plus t squared. Okay, so you're looking at that and you're going, what, how, where did, where did that come from, Jason? Well, the rest of the series is itself a geometric series. In fact, this term right here, this is A for your geometric series. So if you start counting at the n plus first term here, and similarly, r is equal to minus t squared, right? To go from term to term, you are just multiplying by minus t squared. That's what you're seeing as the pattern over the whole series. And therefore, um, you know, you can start counting anywhere you want. So what I wanted to do was get the first n terms in my series. And then what I wanted to do was just hold everything in the remainder off to the back here. And I can do that compactly by using the fact that this was a geometric series. Okay, so now I can do this properly. I can say the tan inverse of X, this is equal to, well, I can integrate up this thing. So from zero to X of one over one plus T squared dt. So that's why I use t, because I needed a dummy variable here. This is just the fundamental theorem of calculus that's at work. And so the first bit of this is polynomial. So we just do it term-wise exactly how we did it uh, previously. So this is x to the 5 over 5 minus x to the 7 over 7. That's as far as I'm going to go. And then up to the very last term, that is minus one, or I suppose the second to last term, t to the 2n plus one divided by 2n plus one, and then plus the remainder term. Uh, sorry, this should be an x, not a t anymore because it got integrated, pardon me. 
Okay, so you know, maybe you're kind of feeling like we're going in circles, right? So what was the point of doing this so far? Well, the point was that we didn't technically show that we have convergence to the tangent function. We sort of informally integrated each term. We said, okay, well then, because we can integrate terms, uh, this is what the power series for arctangent looks like. What we're doing now is con showing that it converges to the tangent function. This really is the series. Now I know for some people who are watching this, maybe this doesn't strike them as the most interesting thing in the world to do, but this is mathematically rigorous, right? We wanna use Taylor's theorem to show that that remainder, or we wanna apply Taylor's theorem by showing that the remainder here goes to zero in order to show that this series indeed converges to the arctangent function or tan inverse. Okay, so to that end, what are we gonna do? Well, let's first remind ourselves, you know, what actually was my remainder? Well, this was the integral from zero to x of, and then that end term that came from summing up the geometric series. So this was t to the two n plus two divided by two, uh, sorry, one plus t squared dt. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to show that this thing goes to zero. So how can we do that? Well, in absolute value, how can we bound this thing? Well, we can say that one over one plus t squared is less than or equal to one, right? That's definitely true for all t. And so we can say that this is the same as integrating to the absolute value of x and taking absolute values on the inside, it's just integrating t to the two n plus two. So the minus one doesn't matter because where you have an absolute value, it's coming inside of the integral and the one over one plus t squared doesn't matter because that thing is less than or equal to one. So that means that we have less than or equal here now. We're bounding the absolute value of that remainder. Okay, why is this good? Well, this thing is easy to integrate and this leaves me with the absolute value of x to, to the power of two n plus three divided by two n plus three which we can see this thing converges to zero uh, if, uh, so as n goes to infinity, if the absolute value of x is less than, actually in this case, less than or equal to one. Now, why is it that I knew it had to be less than or equal to one? Well, that numerator term gets smaller if x in absolute value is less than or equal to one, right? So this is one of the properties that we talked about with sequences that we did a few videos ago. And then the denominator also will sync it. So one over two n plus three goes to zero. But if x is larger than one in absolute value, then the numerator blows up and this thing doesn't converge. And so therefore, this tells me that tan inverse of x is actually only equal to that series. So x minus x cubed over three plus x to the five over five uh, minus x to the seven over seven and so on and so forth when x is less than or equal to one. That's the nuance that I wanted to inject into this, uh, into this discussion because Previously, we just sort of integrated term by term, but we didn't see where we converged. Now we see where we converge, right? We see that this series actually doesn't hold everywhere. It only holds when X is less than or equal to one. That is a very important aspect and it's unintuitive. You probably wouldn't have guessed that that was the case, right? We've seen sine and cosine converge everywhere. So why would we expect arctangent not to? So this is the piece. This is how you can evoke Taylor's theorem and use it to show that these, these uh, Taylor series actually converge to the function you're interested in. Okay, let's talk about another use for this stuff. Um, and in particular, we're gonna see how it can be used to, to evaluate limits. Now, 
One of the ways that we have to evaluate indeterminate forms in terms of limits is using L'Hopital's rule. Now, L'Hopital's rule is great, but sometimes it can be uh, a little bit of a pain because it takes me a lot of work uh, you know, to take some derivatives. And so what we're going to see now is that we can use Taylor series to simplify a lot of our computations here. So let's take a look at an example. So example five. Let's evaluate. Okay, let's evaluate the limit as x goes to one of the lo natural logarithm of x divided by x minus one. Okay. So clearly, you know, if you just plug x equal to one in here, you get zero over zero. Life is no good. So here's what we want to do. We want to uh, evaluate the Taylor series of the logarithm of x around x equal to one and use it to cancel with those x minus one factors in the denominator. So what you can do is you can calculate the logarithm of x. In this case, you want to center this thing around x is equal to one. So this gives you ln of one and then plus uh, one over one. So that's the derivative. I'll just write that as one to simplify it. The derivative divided by one times x minus one and then minus one half x minus one squared and blah, blah, blah. So this is the Taylor series. So Taylor series of ln of x about x equal to one, right? So that's all I'm doing. I'm only gonna compute the first few terms because as you're gonna see, that's all that I really need. Um, and so the other thing that you remember is where each of these terms come from. So this is just, or sorry, this term is uh, ln, oh, well, it's just the function evaluated at the center. So this is f of one. Then the next term after that is f prime of one divided by one factorial. And then f double prime of one divided by two factorial. So that's where the one half comes from and so on and so forth. But here's why this is great. I know that every other term beyond that has factors of x minus one in it. And so that tells me that the logarithm of x divided by x minus one, well, it too has a Taylor series representation. And in fact, it's going to be the ln of one, which I haven't simplified it to be zero yet. I just wanted to uh, keep it in for, for uh, just to illustrate and then times x minus one minus one half over x minus one squared plus more terms with x minus ones in them divided by x minus one. And so this gives me the limit as x approaches one. Now, as I said, this thing is zero. And so now you can see that the x minus one in the, the denominator can be uh, divided into each term of the Taylor series individually. And so I get x minus one divided by x minus one, that's one. And then minus one half x minus one, that takes the division by x minus one takes off a power from that thing. And then something with a quadratic power and then something with a cubic power and blah, 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 blah. But taking x to one means this goes away and everything else goes away because it has higher powers. And so what am I left with? I'm left with a limit of one. If you don't believe me, you know, go back and use L'Hopital's rule. That'll do the trick as well. It just might be a little bit more work than you want it to be. Okay, let's do another one. Uh, and, and this one, if you wanna use L'Hopital's rule, you're gonna have to use it like three or four times. And so that's a lot of L'Hopital applications here. We want to keep our lives simple. And so we are going to use you know, known uh, Taylor series expansions in order to evaluate sine of x minus tan of x divided by x. 
Okay, so just like with the previous example, we're going to expand our Taylor series out. So sine of X, again, all that really matters is just the leading few terms. So that's all that we're going to use. I'm going to use up to the first three terms of this series, X minus X cubed over three factorial plus X to the five over five factorial. And you can just disregard the, the latter ones because they will all disappear. Sorry, we're going to make this X cubed in the denominator of the limit, make it a little more exciting. You can use whatever power you want. Uh, but I'm going to make it high enough so that L'Hopital's rule is not an effective method to do this. And tan of x, well, tan of x is x plus x cubed over 3 plus 2x to the 5 over 15. And then, you know, there's more, but it's a lot of work. So, you know, we just found the first few terms of this Taylor series. Again, you can just use Taylor's formula for these things, you know, f prime at zero divided by one, f double prime at zero divided by two factorial and so on and so forth. But what does this mean? I can subtract these series from each other. The x's cancel and x cubed over three factorial, that's x cubed over six, and then minus x cubed over three here. So this leaves me with minus x cubed over two. And then same thing with the fifth order terms, five factorial is 120. Uh, and so you can do a little bit of algebraic manipulation here. You get x to the five over eight, uh, and then blah, 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 which let me make my life simple. Let me factor out an x cubed here. I get minus one half minus x squared over eight, and then more terms that I do not care about. But then therefore, I can evaluate my limit in the same way that I just did above. So I get sine of x minus tan of x divided by x cubed. And this gives me, if I do my expansion here, the x cubed that I factored out is going to cancel with the x cubed in the denominator. And this leaves me with minus one half minus x squared over eight minus infinitely many more terms. And they all disappear when x goes to zero. And so therefore, I get minus one half. So this is interesting, right? This makes things a lot easier. I think, you know, if you want to use L'Hopital's rule, which you can check this uh, uh, using L'Hopital's rule, it would be a lot more work. You know, all I had to do was find the Taylor series up to like the first three terms, subtract them. So that's algebra, that's relatively easy. That's certainly easier than taking a derivative and then, you know, doing a little cancellation. It wasn't too bad, right? It really makes things uh, a lot nicer. Okay, one more example here. Let's do a, let's do a slightly harder one where things aren't gonna be necessarily as fun. So let's do the limit as x goes to zero of one over sine of x minus one over x. So this one is pretty ugly. Uh, and so we're gonna have to use a lot of Taylor series expansions here. But the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna simplify the, uh, the expansion or the, the subtraction. So we find a common denominator. This is x minus sine of x divided by x times sine of x, which now we are going to use the, the expansion for sine of x. So we get x minus, now we just had it on the previous slide, x cubed over three factorial plus x to the five over five factorial, blah, blah, blah. And then divided by x times x minus x cubed, over three factorial plus x to the five over five factorial. So all that I'm doing is just filling in the Taylor expansion for sine here, nothing fancy. And so what is it that I have here? Well, I can simplify this. So I'm going to distribute in the denominator, the minus into everything. You can see the X terms will disappear. 
I'm left with x cubed over three factorial, uh, sorry, minus x to the five over five factorial, and then plus whatever is on the top. And then I'll multiply that x uh, into this bracket and I get x squared minus x to the four over three factorial plus x to the six over five factorial and so on. And now let's factor out an x cubed from the top and an x squared from the bottom. This will leave me with an x, x cubed divided by x squared. And then one, uh, one over three factorial, pardon me, one over three factorial minus uh, x squared over five factorial and everything else has an x in it. So I do not care about it. Uh, and then on the bottom, you know, one minus x squared over three factorial plus x to the four over five factorial. So it's, it's kind of ugly to write, but of course, you know how this works now, right? Because I can let x go to zero and you can see what's gonna happen. The fraction is gonna become x times one over three factorial divided by one, which goes to zero with x going to zero. So let's just write that in. Therefore, the limit as x goes to zero of one over sine of x minus one over x is equal to the limit as x goes to zero of x times one over three factorial minus x squared over five factorial plus more stuff with x's in it divided by one minus x squared over three factorial. And I'm not even gonna write that fourth order term because it's, you know, it's doing nothing in the limit anyways, right? Because in the limit, you say goodbye to this term and all of the terms that come after it, you say goodbye to this term and all of the terms that come after it, sorry. And so you're just left with X uh, multiplied outside by some constant gives you a nice zero. So that gives you another nice way of evaluating limits. So as I said, uh, I prefer to use the Taylor series method for evaluating limits because I find it easier than using L'Hopital's rule, uh, especially you know, for much more complicated functions where uh, you know, I can find relatively simple Taylor series without having to do a whole bunch of derivatives. That means you know, I can find the Taylor series by multiplying Taylor series of other functions together. So for example, sine squared times cos of x uh, divided by x squared, and I take the limit as x goes to zero. You know, in that case, L'Hopital's rule is going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a lot of derivatives. It's going to be a lot of bookkeeping. Whereas using Taylor series here might be slightly more efficient for you, depending on how you feel about this. But the point was that we saw today in this video that Taylor series can really simplify and aid us in our mathematical discovery in our mathematical journey here, right? It can be used to uh, say, evaluate very, very difficult integrals. And in particular, we can use those to numerically evaluate definite integrals, right? We saw that with the integral from zero to one of sine of x squared. And then we also saw how this can help us to evaluate limits.